update with a particular focus on Vancouver. If you get any sort of value entertainment out of these videos, all I ask that you hit thumbs up and subscribe. Questions, comments, put those below. Uh, I want to talk about this week. Uh, I just came back from an event, uh, the annual housing event uh, put on by Altus Group Data Solutions here in Vancouver. Uh, I am a subscriber to them, um, but they provided this sort of outlook on the on the housing market, what they see, what they expect. Um, basically, pretty much what I've talked about along these videos is um, there is obviously an uptick. They feel that that's going to filter through into the market, but the recovery uh, remains very much a question mark in terms of is it going to be sustainable? I think that they talked about the obvious headwinds being um, record number of new housing coming to market over the next 24 months. And basically the pre-sale activity has slowed down. Uh, what they can actually see here in this chart is there's eight months of inventory that is unsold in terms of at pre-sale uh, locations. That is the highest months of inventory that we've seen, I think dating back to 2013. So developers are sort of stuck with a lot of inventory that is unsold. Um, which is then causing them to um, pull back aggressively in their new land acquisitions, as we can see in this chart here. Um, so you have these two mechanisms, which are ultimately going to weigh on economic growth uh, here locally, as well as job creation. Um, I think that's evident. But I think what um, you know, what these housing conferences and housing analysis, what they always fail to omit is you know, global, global economics and what's happening in the finance space, i.e., you know, monetary policy and how that will impact um, financial assets. That always gets omitted because I think that, you know, that's not really their expertise to go into depth on those topics. But I would argue that uh, what's happening, what central banks are doing and what's happening in financial markets, particularly on a global scale, very much impacts a global market such as Vancouver. So I like to keep an eye on that. I mean, I think it's amazing just to see uh, you know how the, the the extensive length that central banks are going to to basically keep the system going and keep the expansion moving. I mean, we're ten years. We're officially in the longest economic expansion uh, in in recent modern financial history. And the fact that central banks are doing everything they can to extend that, um, you know, continuously lowering interest rates and re-engaging in quantitative easing. I mean, not only that, but you have more and more calls for monetary monetary theory, modern monetary theory, MMT, which is basically excessive money printing to finance government deficits uh, and fiscal spending. Um, but you now have like, you know, President Trump, whether you love him or hate him, uh, you know, he's calling out the Federal Reserve begging for negative interest rates and re-engaging in money printing, i.e. quantitative easing. Everybody wants some of that cheap money. So I'm just gonna clip out to that Donald Trump um, awesome or hilarious uh, quote. We have ended the war on American here. workers. We have stopped the assault on American industry. And we have launched an economic boom, the likes of which we have never seen before. I did this despite a near record number of rate increases and quantitative tightening by the Federal Reserve since I won the election. Eight increases in total, which were, in my opinion, far too fast an increase and far too slow a decrease. Because remember, we are actively competing with nations who openly cut interest rates so that now many are actually getting paid when they pay off their loan, known as negative interest. Who ever heard of such a thing? Give me some of that. <laughs> Give me some of that money. I want some of that money. Our Federal Reserve doesn't let us do it. I don't say thank you, thank you. The smart people are clapping. Only the smart people are clapping. I don't say that's good for the world. I'm not president of the world. I'm president of our country. But we are competing against these other countries nonetheless. And the Federal Reserve doesn't let us play at that game. It puts us at a competitive disadvantage to other countries. And sure enough, Trump uh, is definitely getting his wishes. Um, as you can see, the quantitative easing QE machine 
um, is back in full force. Uh, or as the Federal Reserve says, don't call it QE, but make no mistake, um, this action that they're doing in the repo market um, is clearly a version of QE, whether you want to call it that or not. Um, this is going on from basically you're in a system now where there's so much debt, whether that's in, in consumers, uh, whether that's in businesses or in governments, you can't be in a situation to normalize interest rates. I mean, all you have to do is look at the situation that Canadian consumers are in, for example. So everybody's talked about you know, household debt, Canadian consumers are over leveraged, that's gonna blow up sometime, house prices are gonna crash. The thing is we've been saying that now for over a decade and those concerns are very, very real. Um, you have the most over leveraged consumers in the G7, um, arguably the G20 next to Australia. Um, but now what you can see is in Australia, um, after home prices started cratering there, sales dropped to 21 year lows, the Aussie central bank has slashed rates to record lows. And now they're talking about engaging in some form of quantitative easing, i.e., again, more money printing to sort of keep that going. And now you're starting to see the rebound in Aussie home prices. They're talking about um, CoreLogic, which is one of the larger research companies on the housing market um, in Australia, is forecasting 15% price growth in Sydney and Melbourne in 2020. Again, I don't know, I'm not the expert on Sydney and Melbourne, but again, the fact that central banks and regulators in Australia are going to such extreme, literally extreme lengths to keep that going, it's basically like lower asset prices will not be tolerated. Uh, I think it was just fascinating. And uh, it kind of makes me curious as to you know, how Canada um, would move forward in the event that uh, we get a sort of a beginning of a prolonged slump in housing is what lengths are they willing to go to? Again, they're basically rewriting the rules here where money becomes essentially free and almost worthless. Um, the fact that you're just going to keep printing money to paper over the issues. Um, I think what we can partially see that is you have consumer insolvencies in Canada beginning to creep up towards, um, you know, I would say, fairly impressive growth, um, you know, over into double digit growth in the increase in consumer insolvencies in Canada, despite interest rates being at near record lows, 1.75% interest rate in Canada and consumer insolvencies are rising when we have basically a record low unemployment uh, rate and strong rampant wage growth. So uh, you basically have consumers um, going delinquent in an environment of record low rates and full employment. So you can only imagine a scenario where rates were to hypothetically normalize or you know, you're sort of get some sort of weakness or shock to the economy and the labor market, i.e. someone gets laid off and job growth starts to slow and contract. You can imagine the impact that may have on consumer uh, households and particularly the number of insolvencies. So uh, I think that kind of goes to show that this is the situation, this is the uh, macroeconomic or financial landscape that we have created over these years. Um, and I think that, I think everybody knows it's on an unsustainable path. It's just a matter of like, what is, what, how do you fix that? And what what does what does the new what does that system look like? Does it look like a debt jubilee? Does it look like some? I mean, I would argue MMT is almost some form of that, where basically um, fiscal spending uh, does not matter because it gets financed by central bank money printing. Um, how, how does that look? I would argue that it's probably some form of that, and this is why Ray Dalio says the world is a mad, has gone mad, and is awash in money. Um, there's just too much money circulating, looking for safe havens to park into assets um, because central banks and governments are going to such extreme lengths. So um, that's kind of what I'm focused on here as we gear towards closer into 2020 and we try to figure out the direction of the housing markets uh, here in Canada. Um, that's, that's kind of my focus is just what extreme lengths are we gonna go to um, given the political and monetary landscape. So uh, anyways, hope that helped. Otherwise, see you next week.